Good evening, my children of the night, servants to the spirits. You have chosen unwisely to enter into the realm of our demonic podcast. The midnight hour is close at hand, and darkness falls across the land, where the beasts and slashers are out in search of blood. For now we remain safe in shelter, to talk on movies which conjure up our every nightmare. But this will not last long. We must survive the night. This is... It Records. I'm Matt Johnson, as always. And I'm Peter Hansen. We welcome you to our podcast. We'll be discussing the 1973 horror classic, The Exorcist. Directed by William Friedkin. 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 A, a bust on the opening. I had it and everything, and I, I Friedkin. That's not, even, that's not even the author's name. Oh, I mean, I'm at a loss. All right. Well, with that blunder, Pete, <laughs> can you take us away into this week's creepy headline? Yes. And <laughs> did you hear me making uh, ghastly noises during your intro? I did hear it, and I appreciated it. <laughs> All right, uh, so our creepy headline of the day is actually a little more timely to our little movie here, as it is The Exorcism of Roland Doe, which is the inspiration for the novel and ultimately the film adaptation. Oh, you don't say. Yeah, and Roland Doe was a pseudonym that was given, because I'm pretty sure they just didn't know the guy's name, the little boy's name. Sure. I don't know where they were. I got, I'll tell you once I figure that out. Once I read it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it happened in the 1940s. <clears throat> and uh, the origin of these claims say that there was uh, reports of alleged possession and exorcism. The source of these reports is thought to be a family, his former pastor, uh, Luther Miles Schultz. I think is how you say that. According to one account, a total of 48 people witnessed this exorcism, nine of them Jesuits. That's a lot of people. Yeah, that's a lot of people. (laughs) According to author Thomas B. Allen, Jesuit priest William H. Halloran was one of the last surviving eyewitnesses of the events and participated in the exorcism. Allen wrote that the diary kept by attending priest Raymond Bishop detailed the exorcism performed on the pseudonym identified Roland Doe, a.k.a. Robbie. Speaking in 2013, Alan emphasizes a definite proof that the boy, only known as Robbie, was possessed by malevolent spirits is unattainable. Maybe he instead suffered from mental illness or sexual abuse or fabricated the entire experience, according to Alan. Alan also expresses skepticism about potential paranormal events before his death. So, oh. Kind of so it's kind of bullshit. all over the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, nonetheless, it could be bullshit, probably, but uh, it was the inspiration for the book, which is the author. I mean, the audience doesn't know was the inspiration for the movie by William Peter Blatty, was the author of the book. Uh, did a lot of research on that story and came up with The Exorcist, which the book, right, Peter is almost directly what that story is you just read, correct? It's not a female, it's not Regan, I believe, in the book. He, he tried to do like a first-hand account of what he had unearthed. Yeah, it seems like the he was he just took a lot from, I wouldn't say he took from, from other exorcisms as well, but I think this was the most... Uh, Pulled it all together? Yeah, because I'm like reading a little bit here that some of like the, like the steps they took uh, seem like they took in the movie, which I assume they took in the book, because uh, you know he wrote both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, Pete, for your your titillating creepy headline, as always. Much appreciated here on this end. But I'll break in now to the actual movie that we watched this week. We'll break it down real quick for. Our viewers who have not seen this movie, again, get out there and see it. It's been out for about 40 years. Uh, <laughs> Better late than never. <laughs> right. Um, if this movie centers around a teenage girl, Regan, she's possessed by some mysterious entity. 
their mother seeks out the help of two priests to save the dog. In a nutshell, that's the film. There's a lot of plot going on in there, but something takes over the daughter and to the priest. That is the exorcist. A lot of build-up to a very intense scenes of the, in the end is what this movie is. I think so, too. Um, it, there was a lot of great exposition and pacing. Like Even the first almost 15 minutes is a lot of little, maybe no dialogue in Iraq during the dig site. It's very, a lot of deep focus shots, I feel like, a lot of silences, which works well with the juxtaposition of like that eerie sort of violin playing. It cuts in um, to a very well paced climax, I would say. Yeah, I would completely agree. But with that being said, we started to break into the movie. Um, and we can talk about it piece by piece. But just some of the things that I found interesting about it that really even still were had a huge impact on me watching it this time around, which is probably like my third time seeing this movie, I think. Um, it's just the mystery of faith in this movie, doubt and vulnerability, um, and really cultural significance, um, generational fear, which plays a lot in many of the work. And I saw that a lot in, in this picture. And I'll go into that more, but do you agree with any of those people? Do you see anything differently in this viewing? Um, you know, I don't know. It was, it was hard because, like, I feel like it, like I, I didn't notice it too much more than I did in my previous viewing. I don't know, maybe I was distracted or something. But like, like the generation feel fear thing, I I didn't really like see that. And I'm trying to think about it now to try and make some references in my head, but I can't I can't connect it. Sure. Um. Well, if you'll allow me, Pete. Uh, I get that really isn't just with this movie specifically, but mainly that time period. Any time period uh, for a horror genre in like the late 60s and definitely the early 70s is the the child being the the villain in films, you know, through demonic possession or anything. You have the omen at that time, Rosemary's Baby's coming out, and that's like the countercultural movement of the baby boomers. Are, are, oh, I see are what the, you're saying. They're the biggest generation. They're seen as sort of rebellious, and they're, they're the enemy. Sort of, and they're they're these the monstrous villain in, in these movies. So I, I saw that obviously, and this was really one of the bigger ones at the time. I mean, Rosemary's Baby came out after this, I believe. It was a seventy three. I thought Rosemary's Baby was sixties. Rosemary's Baby. The Omen seventy six. No, that's later. But either way, that was um, a prevalent theme in, in the horror genre. uncanniness to this film where you don't feel totally um, you definitely feel um, feel for the characters you, you're into their everyday lives where it almost seems like a drama but there's that air that ominous air that kind of hangs over it I don't know if you get that, got that feeling maybe I think it's just because they just the way they open it up and then they kind of set you up for something and even like trying to go this with like a blank slate you know, you're going into a horror film, so you're like, you know something's going to go wrong. And then the fact that they show you, like, everyday life is just very jarring. Yeah. And then, and then obviously, you know, your gut feeling is right because it, it turns sour pretty quickly. You know, I mean, not pretty quickly, but, like, you you see some changes quickly that slowly, you know, that uh, builds up to something bigger within every plot point. True. Yeah. I would concur with that. I concur with that point. <laughs> and that kind of leads me to something that I thought was fascinating about the film that I was able to work in. Um, that idea of like vulnerability in people is it's a horror film, but the director obviously actually didn't think he was directing a horror film when he directed it. 
Uh, we wanted it to be a mystery of fate type movie. Um, just a little tidbit for you there. Didn't want it to be horror. Um, but it's a horror film nonetheless with some gore, some very jarring scenes. Um, but mainly what makes it terrifying is its shared understanding of basic human fears. Um, and you have demons and you have religion in it, but it imag- it makes us imagine what the demons are in our life. And more than that, it takes a human's conditions and ability to maybe reliably face those or overcome them, especially with the ending. I feel like not much is overcome. I don't want to spoil a 1973 movie. <laughs> <laughs> but it's on Netflix, so, uh, you know, watch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's on there. It's a good one. It's a good one. Oh, well, I shouldn't say. We have a... <laughs> I, I guess I'll be defending it later on in the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, we made that very clear. <laughs> Pete, is there any... I've been kind of rambling about thematically about these things that I find interesting. Is there anything that particularly stood out to you in scenes in particular that were made so? Well, as a, a horror junkie, as I like to just made up just now. <laughs> uh, I really enjoy good special effects, uh, good practical effects in the movie, and the fact that there's really, you know, there's just really good acting in this movie, which you don't see a lot. So let's say, or they were very, very scary to see this little girl go through these changes, and um, when they they throw some two scenes at you that just were so intense, it's like here it's like horror scene galore where it's just like everything you want, where it's just like the kid you know slowly possesses where she's being frantically um like moving up and down the bed, and she's like mother. And then yeah. they're trying to hold her in place, and then all these By the way, objects are moving in place. Impression. Sorry, go on. I thought I was actually pretty good. <laughs> I, I was being sincere. Flawless impression of Linda Blair. <laughs> go on. Yeah, my, my voice is a little grilly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't mean to be really. No, no, you're just fine. To compliment you. Um, and then, like, the. I think it's maybe the second time where. Um, where. I guess the demon turns uh, its head all the way around. And then it's like, you know what your cunting daughter did? And it's just like, Jesus. Like, it's just like, you know, they just throw these. I feel like that was pretty, sh- like, that was shocking to me. I'm sure that was shocking in fucking 1973. Oh, it had to be. I mean, <laughs> yeah. It was, it still blew my mind seeing that stuff. Several scenes in this movie. Uh, the crucifix scene. Yeah, I was going to bring that up too. Yeah, that scene was like, what the fuck? That had to just freak people. That was again R rated. How did, how did he get away with that? <laughs> I don't know. A big budget, Warner Brothers big budget probably, and it was a best selling novel. Boom. Yeah, that's probably. Slide under the radar. That's probably what it did. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, Pete, speaking of just enjoying the special effects, which I thought they were phenomenal as well, and the acting in particular. Um, this movie was the first horror movie ever to be nominated for best picture, and several other. Awards and the best special effects, I think, best makeup, but it was the it set the precedent for horror films to be nominated for best picture for the Oscars. Yes, not many have filed place, but at least we got that one with Sons of the Lambs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I saw on the list that uh, and I was reading that Black Swan. They said was the latest one. I wouldn't consider that horror. Uh, yeah, I I was surprised about that one too. I saw that little tidbit, and I was like, is it though? <laughs> That'll be a different podcast. We'll watch Black Swan and debate its horrorness. Oh, yeah. <laughs> its horror qualities. But, no, I, I was actually very impressed with the acting, especially from, I don't know the actor's name, who played the main priest, Father Karras. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He was, which is, was supposed to be Jack Nicholson, uh, originally, who turned it down. Oh, damn. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I still thought he was, I mean, he... He had to lead most of the movie, I feel like, as a as a protagonist, who I had no idea who he was. And I thought he did a very good job. Actually, every every one of the leads did a great great job. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. I also really like the the old the, the old priest. I don't know why. There's just like something about him that's just mm-hmm. like they casted him out because he just feels like you know uh, he seems stoic. Yeah. Almost. There's just something about him that's like comforting and then he's just like try he's just trying to, you know, be there as a priest and trying to help out this little girl who's going through a whole bunch of shit. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. Oh, you, you're very much excused. <laughs> um. Okay. One point that I'd like to make, I guess, I'll give dogmatic again. No pun intended with this movie. Uh, about my themes. Um, that I think's essential to the movie. Um. Towards the end of the second act, um, into the third, there's two scenes that I think are pivotal of the movie. Is Father Karras, he's standing at the altar. He's performing the Eucharist. Do you remember the scene? It's kind oh, of, yeah. Is it? Yeah, it was kind of like, um, not jarring, but it, it steps away from the movie and you're kind of like, why is this here? Like, why is we just watching him perform a mass? But he's reciting a lot of liturgy that speaks to the mystery of faith and his role in the ceremony. And throughout the movie, for everybody, he's very much casting doubt on his faith. He, he doesn't believe, he's not sure if he believes in God anymore, but he is a priest and he's a psychiatrist and he's kind of torn in between. But during that ceremony, um, it's the belief of transubstantiation, bread and wine used in uh, the rituals are consumed to become the body and blood of Christ. So it's relying upon faith of the worshipers. Um, that in your mind, you be, it becomes Christ's actual body and mind. And in his attempt to trick Regan, he sprained holy water in the next scene which is the beginning of the third act. Um, he simply taps, uh, puts tap water on her, and to her, she believes that it's holy water because it, he's a priest, but he knows it isn't. So it's just that pragmatic ideology ideology that's forsaken him um, of being true to your faith and that whole doubt portion of it. Now that's a lot to chew, <laughs> but I think that was essential to the movie is that whole idea and it was in the end of act two going into act three of transubstantiation becoming one with god do you believe or do you not and you could see a lot of doubt even in the third act with uh how you could see him breaking during the uh the exorcism where he's just like like he's just like almost speechless just like looking at um the demon um who has a name in fact but that's not named until the second movie Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. And with that, um, I was going to say, um, you kind of see him break during the exor- exorcism. A lot of what it is um, is pulling out your inner demons, I think, thematically in this movie. Um, he sees his mother, his dead mother, um, when he's going to the exorcism instead of Regan, um, basically saying whatever's inside will be shown outside, ultimately. So whatever you're hiding, whatever you're casting... It's gonna come to the surface. Oh, look at you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> That's just an idea, app. And with the whole idea of vulnerability that you were talking about, the first lines basically from the, the original father in Iraq, I forget his father Miriam, Father Miriam. Yeah. Right? Um, then the main father and then even the mother, all of their first lines are lines of doubt. Um the old man is questioning his, his mobility and his um, his mortality, basically, when he has the shakes and he's looking at the older, robust, robust men. The, the mother has a vulnerable line about she doesn't really know wh- where this movie's going, what's the point of it. And the father, his first line is, he doesn't have faith in God. So you're already seeing all these characters oh. have doubt and they're vulnerable just from the get-go when you're introduced to them. And how they transcend that when they're confronted with their fear. <laughs> I like the little uh, you know, just pull your glasses off and put them back on. That was a nice touch. Yeah, yeah for the podcast listener, I shifted my glasses back and forth. Um, <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. With that being said, on a little lighter note, the character that was, I guess, the most ridiculous um, is that drunk guy who was just calling out the Burgess surf- or Burgess? I don't know. <laughs> oh, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
when okay. he's like calling the butler like a Nazi and stuff. He's just <laughs> like, like what the hell? Like I mean, it is like a couple, you know, only like fifteen years probably after the war. Only a little, maybe a little longer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but he's he holds a serious grudge. Yeah, and then like the butler's just like he just can't take anymore. He just starts like he's just like I'll kill Chokes you. Him out. <laughs> Slams the tray down and goes right after him. But, uh, without him, but, uh, I guess that was, it wasn't, like, ridiculous, but it was just, like, I mean, I don't know. It didn't, like, take me out of it, but it was just, like, very weird seeing that again. <laughs> yeah. It just seems a little, a little off-paced or out of place, really. Um, but I guess you have to keep him in there because he's the mother's love interest. I don't remember that. That's the guy. Oh. Uh, see, I totally forgot about that guy. Like it was mentioned, but like they didn't, they don't have yeah, they a whole don't. lot of interaction with each other. They don't. That's the craziest thing is that she just mentions it to Regan, but no on-screen like romance. But they're in scenes together, and never talk about it together. That's, and, that's my one beef with this movie. Um, you know the first person who is thrown from the stairs that dies. Who who is who? Who do they tell the watch? Read. I I I was trying that's to. That's him. That's that what. Guy. Okay. That's what I thought for a second, but I like I I couldn't remember his name, and then. It's like. I, yeah, it was just, it was. I just was like fuzzy. couldn't piece it together for some reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that was him. It's like Bruges or something, or Burgess, Burgess, I think. And another well, weird, weird character to me. Sorry to cut you off there. Uh, was the police the police inspector? I don't know. He seemed just a little. Yeah, his character. <laughs> he seemed aloof, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, he, he seemed didn't... like a really old character. You know what I mean? Like, uh, like you know how he's talking about old old movies. Uh, mm-hmm. He kind of comes off to me that way, like an old movie character. He is almost like yeah. A private. I mean, he was like a private eye, but like an old nineteen forties film noir private eye type guy. Yeah, that's trying, yeah. trying to solve his case. That's what I got from him too. Where, and then he like wanted the autograph. <laughs> he was like, "Oh, it's for me." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not for my daughter. It's uh, it's for me. <laughs> just give me. Just give it to me. Well, we got a lot of this movie in the context of this movie. Can we go into the production? And just sort of the, the marketing of it, really. Because there's a lot to this movie. Pre-planning and reception. Yeah, I know we were kind of talking about it uh, beforehand. Um, yeah. Where there was just like a lot of crazy stuff that went on set where, you know, um, the set was kept at a really cold temperature just so they could, you know, um, have people, you know, you could see their breath. And uh, I, th- I know, I think the set caught on fire and, yeah. Um. Someone's kid died. You know. There's. You know. It's considered like a cursed, um, uh, set or whatever because yeah, people were dying or something. I. It's just like a one of those movies. Like The Omen is another one. <laughs> that yeah. Has, that's not... And uh, Poltergeist is another movie that's supposed to be cursed. Sure. Yeah. I have the cursed sets, but um, just some some background that I found during production or the theatrical release of it really um is the uh, is the trailer the, the initial teaser trailer which if nobody has seen that i would say we'll put it on our up with our podcast yeah we'll we'll, we'll get it online for we'll you. insert it right now Something beyond comprehension is happening to a little girl on this street, in this house. A man has been sent for, as a last resort, to try and save her.
Mercedes in Cambridge? I mean, was that familiar to you? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the the lady who provided the voice of the demon, who originally went uncredited in the film. Oof. And Linda Blair got nominated for Best Supporting Actress at the Oscars for oh, it, man. where it was mainly this. It was Mercedes doing the voice, oh, who then later after the film's reception, after the acquittal, sued Warner Brothers, which and she's on rightfully so. I mean, that's pretty shitty that they. Man, that's really shitty. But it was her request prior to not to not be uh, to not be credited, so people would think it was Linda Blair. But as soon as it was perceived as like a critical success for the Oscars, uh, she has to be put on. Okay, then that's not so bad then. Yeah. So, mm, so I understand her approach, which I like her idea of not wanting to be so everybody thinks it's Linda Blair the whole time. Yeah, that was a pretty good idea actually. Keep, keeps the keeps the allure that it's her. Yeah. Uh, and just real quick, I'll touch on this. Um, the whole production of it, Pete, you might know more than me on this, but William Friedkin's methods <laughs> on this film were rather extreme. I guess he wanted to be very visceral and get actual reactions from people, as going so far as to shoot a gun on set <laughs> uh, near a person's ear so that they would react to a gunshot. That was a few of them. And he would actually tie people to harnesses and pull them. Like, Linda Blair was tied to the bed. Yeah, I think they didn't. I think I want to say that they didn't give her like a warning either, so they could get like, a, I guess, a, a real life <laughs> reaction. <laughs> yeah, and with that, I um, just, who, who, I, I, say, I feel like he's just like really, he just coming off the French Connection, which is like a very realism movie with like cops, and I yeah. think he's like still in that mode. Where he was just like trying to make his movie as realistic as possible by like having general fear reactions. I think that was his justification. And he may have pissed off a lot of people, but I think in the end he came off with a pretty awesome movie. <laughs> no, I'd agree. I'm sure people in ju- justified they could be pissed, but I think that's, I agree that's what he was going for, and it does come off very visceral this movie and it seemed like general reactions from these people um as well as the scene where the mother i can't think of her name is it chris yeah it was chris the mother she when she falls over the first time we see uh linda blair as a demon and she's got the crucifix she falls over backwards and that chest is coming out of her the drawers she literally got ripped back by a harness from him um and she uh fractured her coccyx in her back so that scream it was real. She fractured her coccyx and was injured for the rest of the film. Oh, man. Yeah. So, that that pain, that's real pain. That scene. <laughs> that hurt. No wonder that scream was uh, <laughs> very uh, gut-wrenching. <laughs> yeah. Well, she really hurt herself. <laughs> uh, props um, to her for keeping it real. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Continuing through the shot. Another bit of tidbit. The, this is Warner Brothers. Pete, you know that? I know you're a big fan of WB. Uh, <laughs> More of a universal guy, actually. <laughs> nah, you would be, Pete. <laughs> um, but Warner Brothers, this is adjusted for inflation, apparently. This is their highest grossing film. Of all time. I know, like... Uh... And they have Harry Potters too. Oh yeah, I didn't even think about that. I know um, it grossed f- about four hundred million. I think I, I saw it on the page. Yeah, and that's that's quite a bit of money in nineteen seventy three. Seventy three, yeah, four hundred million. And the budget wasn't. It was pretty high. It was a pretty big budget film for the time. Oh, tw- what twelve million? I just yeah, twelve million. I guess it's not for nineteen seventy three. That's fairly large. Yeah, I mean. Did, they didn't really have, like, big budget movies then. Like, the only one that could... I mean, not even Jaws really had that big of a budget. You know, that would be, like... That's, like, the first blockbuster, technically. Whoa, wait, wait, wait. Would this be the first blockbuster, Pete? I was gonna challenge you there. Because this is 73. And Jaws is 75. Does... Actually take I mean, didn't Jaws, take didn't take Jaws make more money? And have lower budget? Yeah. 
that's that's a question that I can answer. Do you think Jaws uh, was able to make four hundred million? I think it, I think it didn't work. I thought it made more than that, honestly. <laughs> when you're right, you're right. You stand corrected. It made 470 million with the smaller budget. So pretty comparable, but Jaws takes the cake. I mean, it's a it's a tough one because like I don't know, like I guess we could go into like a little mini episode, like blockbusters, but a mini episode. <laughs> What's that mean? <laughs> But, like, I mean, blockbusters doesn't really tie into horror that much, but Jaws is a horror movie and a blockbuster. <laughs> yeah. There's, we could make a thing on blockbuster horror movies. We could definitely make the case for a few of them. Yeah, you know what? Well, it's a... Uh... Like a sequel for uh, a, pre- a, the, a prequel sequel for this movie, which was a $30 million budget. Uh, made only two hundred fifty thousand. <laughs> you know, uh, we could do it. Which prequel sequel would you say that? Was it Dominion or is it uh the other one? <laughs> <laughs> that one's Dominion. The other one I think is called The Beginning. But this is great. I think this is actually uh the, that prequel is the first one called After Since the Beginning. Lazy name, first and last. But I think the second one is called Dominion, the prequel to the Exorcist. <laughs> that is so confusing. <laughs> yeah, I remember <laughs> which one's I remember when I bought the anthology uh, Exorcist on Blu-ray, whereas like all five films, that, uh, I saw that title and I was like, "Wait, what? <laughs> like, what? What? Did, yeah, what did that say?" That's almost as bad as the Rambo series. Do you know the first Rambo movie? First Blood. Yeah. What's the second Rambo movie called? Uh, Rambo First Blood Part Two, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First Blood Part 2, and then, no, it's not called, Rambo's the third one. First Blood, First Blood Part 2, then Rambo. No, it, it, it's, like, it, no it's Rambo 3, then Rambo 4. Oh, Rambo, they, they call it Rambo 3. Oh, no, okay. then, it, it's then, so then it's just like Rambo. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Rambo, just like he did with Rocky, Rocky Balboa, who's just the sixth one, <laughs> was his name. Anyway, we're getting on a Stallone shit. <laughs> rain, rain it in, rain it in. Prequels. Well, we talked prequels just two seconds ago. We got prequel, Dominion, and the beginning, which didn't really pan out critically and budget. Well, I mean, uh, box office wise. Um, but we got two sequels: The Heretic and just Exorcist Three. Right? Yeah, and I've seen. I have seen. I've it. seen this two sequels, and Exorcist Two: The Heretic is probably one of the worst movies I've ever seen. It's pretty. Okay. It's pretty fucking terrible. Um, uh, Linda Blair is a little older, and it, oh, Linda Blair is yeah, there. and I think the mom's in it too. And it's weird because they weren't. They like made her like more sexualized, and I was very uncomfortable with that. Yeah. Okay. Where it just it just really felt like they were. I don't know if they were. They probably were doing it on purpose. Who knows. <laughs> um, Probably, <laughs> but it, it it was just bad. That that wasn't the only reason it was bad. There's uh, a whole lot of other reasons. It just doesn't make any fucking sense. <laughs> okay. And they F- fair they enough. go back to the same house again for some reason. I don't know. And then there's two Linda Blairs. I don't know what's going on in that movie. <laughs> so you're saying you defend it? <laughs> and you'd recommend? I'll, it to I'll everyone. defend The Exorcist, but there's no way in hell. Uh-huh. I'm defending the exorcist. The heretic. <laughs> <laughs> I like what you did there. We should, have, we should have thought that out more and just did all hell devil based on this. But the third one, I think, is uh, pretty solid. It's got George C. Scott in it, so it's got some dramatic heft in it. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's directed by the, the writer of this movie the, and the author of the book, William Peter Platty. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. Um, that one, it's it's good, but it, I don't know his his way how he handles like horror themes is just, it just I don't know it it just felt like he he just didn't know what 
you how to do uh, how to do that. Um, if that makes I phrased mm-hmm. that kind of weird, but um, it's like he had a hard yeah. time with those scenes. Well, to quote him, if I may, um, I have a quote from him. He uh, he wanted it to be a psychological thriller. He's not a special effects horror film kind of guy. That's a quote from him in the commentary of Exorcist Three. Okay. There is so one you, you, scene. Right on point. There is one scene in it that's pretty fucking amazing. That's with George C. Scott, and it's very dramatic. Like in props to George C. Scott for pulling off the scene, and it's very intense. And the ending is uh, pretty interesting. You could skip too. You're not going to miss anything out there. <laughs> You'll be fine. Okay. Uh, I, real quick, while I have these quotes up from directors, uh, I'd like to point out a quote from the director, Paul Schrader of Dominion, which is the worst movie of the budget wise, and I guess box office wise, 250000 His quote on the movie is I had a different film in mind. <laughs> <laughs> Off to a good start. Uh, that's, that's great. That's great. So Pete, now that we've talked sequels, we've talked remakes, we've talked themes, would you defend or destroy The Exorcist? I said it a little earlier, but I absolutely would uh, defend this movie. It's pretty great, as it's pretty fun. as we said. It's like it has a, a lot of dramatic heft in this movie, and it's executed well. Um, I would say, you know, um, I know some people that probably won't like it because I think. Um, some people have a hard time seeing old movies, older movies, you know, mm-hmm. I, I could see someone like that, but for, if you're into horror films, I would say you're going to like it. I would agree. Um, and I, I'm going to defend it as well, not destroy it and recommend it. I think it hits on a lot of, I mean... I mean, it's got great exposition. You feel for the characters. It's it's it has depth. I think which people don't often. If you're not into the horror genre, you don't think of them having depth in a lot of these thematic elements, which I think this has in spades, if you will. Um, it's got a great story to it. It's ominous. It's filmed well. Just all around the whole, Exorcist nails it. And I do really like the ending. I don't want to spoil it, but I'll, it just it leaves me with this. Um, the battle between good and evil, which you see in this film, which is those forces, um, you kind of see it end in an exhausting and uneasy draw. Um, you're not really given resolution, which I which I thought was an interesting take. And very seventies, <laughs> very seventies, yeah, um, um, very fitting of the time, early seventies, but. Um, I thought that was a good take, and especially the last scene. I thought that was well, not the last scene, but the climactic end of the exorcist. Yeah. Exorcist. Um, something that I was gonna say. Oh, shoot! I literally just forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone. It's gone. <laughs> all right, that's all we got. <laughs> oh man, I literally like I had it in mind. Was gonna say it, and I was like, blank. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> Great people. <laughs> oh, man. Well, maybe we'll come back to it. If not, we'll drop it in the next mini episode, which we hope to be coming out very soon. If you haven't caught on to our mini episodes, check it out <laughs> online. They're like an episode, but smaller. <laughs> They're half of a normal episode if you focus on the subgenre. They're great. Um, but, speaking of our next episode, I'm going to drop the, the title that we're going to review next time. Pete, this one's on you, my man. Oh. <laughs> this uh, yeah. is a very, uh, it's very different from the episodes that we've been doing lately. I think. Um, yeah, it's not a horror film at all. <laughs> not, no, it's, uh, I would say most, not to sound annoying, but I would say most people probably have not seen this movie where, you know, our episodes before we did Fright Night, eating like Cloverfield and now The Exorcist, you know, I would say that had a larger audience than this movie. I'm only saying that because I haven't seen this movie yet. (laughs) (laughs) 
and it's been something I wanted to check out for a while, but it's uh, called Torso, and it's a, a Giallo movie, um, which is... What's that, Pete? It's an Italian subgenre, which is pretty much the precursor to uh, slasher movies. But okay. um, <clears throat> they're like very focused on like kind of like I want to say very mystery. Like they're very influenced by Hitchcock, but they're um, more sexualized hmm. and uh, more brutal. Okay, so late sixties, early seventies, these movies are coming out. Yeah, I would say. In Italy. Yeah, that's uh, that's a pretty good guess. Okay. That's uh, that's pretty much right on the money. <laughs> Okay. Well, I'm excited for it. Um, I haven't seen it either. Pete's selling me on it. And next week, we will have the Hit Records podcast on Torso. 1972. Which is on Hulu, but, if uh, you're wondering. <laughs> you can find it on Hulu, Amazon, YouTube, or Netflix. Probably not Netflix. Uh, no, it's, it's not a Netflix. Ah. All right. <laughs> well, that has been our review this week of The Exorcist. I hope you enjoyed it. We try to be stimulating the best that we can. Until next time, I'm Matt Johnson. I remain in the shadows. And I'm Peter Hansen. And you can email us at itrecordspodcast at gmail.com.